taking your time at this late hour of the day is quite a challenge. Uh, uh, we've had a long series of, of very fine presentations and I will do my very best to not only keep you awake but possibly keep you interested in, in uh, what I have to say about climate change. Um, I will talk about a European project called um, Climate for Culture. Uh, and um, it's about the impact of climate change on the built uh, heritage uh, of, of Europe. Um, I think most of us accept climate change as a fact. Uh, it is something that we have to deal with uh, sooner or later. There is a great uncertainty associated um, uh, with the predictions, uh, but it is something that we have to actively uh, deal with. The Climate for Culture project uh, is a large-scale integrated project. And large means large. On a typical project meeting, we would have 50 to 60 people. A uh, budget of 6.5 million euro, 27 partners distributed over Europe. Uh, the strength about this, it gave us the numbers and the width uh, in the project to, to carry out a very complex task of integrating global climate simulations with building simulations to risk assessments uh, for the future. Starting out, um, we aimed to answer three quite general questions. First one, what will be the effects of climate change on cultural heritage in Europe? Uh, the second question is, what can we do about it? What mitigation strategies are necessary to prevent damage to movable and immovable cultural heritage? And the third question, what will, co what will it cost us if we do not react in time? I will address the two first questions. Some of you may be interested in the third one, but I will have to refer you to, to uh, the reports that are coming soon. How the um, project focuses on indoor climate, uh, indoor climate issues. It's not limited to that. And the reason for that is because there was a previous project, NOx Arc, which dealt largely with outdoor effects from, on buildings on, on climate change. So if you have a building with a proper climate control, Climate change is not going to make that much of a difference on the indoor climate. Uh, but energy demand may change. It could require more energy, it could require less energy. If you have a building without any climate control, then of course it would be very vulnerable to climate change because the indoor climate will be a reflection of the outdoor climate of the future. Uh, so we've looked at both these kinds of buildings and a range in between. My presentation uh, will be a lot about a method, and I think that the method is really the main result of the project. I will present some samples of results, uh, talk about mitigation, and finally discussion on, on how we could use both the methods and the results as such. Uh, so hopefully, if you're worried about climate change in general, I'm hoping that by the end of this presentation, you're worried about climate change in particular, meaning that we're trying to find a method to more specifically identify risks associated with climate change rather than talking about or worrying about it in general. This picture shows the overall method that we've used. So uh, I will present it briefly and then go through each step of the method. Starting with climate scenarios, same way as, as the UN Climate Panel does, uh, we have carried out global climate simulations which give us the future outdoor climate. Using the future outdoor climate as input for building simulations, we can calculate the future indoor climate in buildings of different character, different kinds of climate control. We connect this to damage functions which relate indoor climate to damage and to risk, uh, and that way we can produce risk assessments. Uh, 
So this is the overall approach. For the global climate simulations, we've used two different scenarios. I'm sure you've heard about or you know about the different climate scenarios that are used. They're based on different economic development, political development, uh, on, on emissions of, of, of greenhouse gases, etc. We have selected two middle-of-the-road scenarios, uh, meaning or intending to, to, to uh, identify uh, sort of a, a, a probable outcome, not trying to aiming for something extreme. The time scale that we've used is based on three periods. The recent past, 1960 to 1990, uh, which is uh, our reference period. This is based on measurements. The near future, 2020 to 2050. And the far future, 2070 to 2100. The global simulations have produced data for more than 900 locations over Europe, providing us a grid with a future outdoor climate. Then we've used this for two different kinds of building simulations. For those of you who dealt with, with building simulations, you know if you want to set up a full model for building simulations, it takes a lot of time. So we've done that on a few selected case studies, uh, mostly monumental buildings uh, of great symbolic value. Uh, and uh, that's one track. The other way is to use uh, something that's called transfer functions. These are simplified models that allow us to make a great number of calculations uh, on many different kinds of buildings uh, and also in all the 900 locations indicated on the grid, grid that I showed you before. We have connected the results of the building simulation to damage functions. And the damage function is something that relates the uh, indoor climate to risks. And these are the main damage functions that we've been using. Mechanical damage to wood and painted wood. Chemical damage to paper, textiles and photographic material. And biological damage, to mo referring to mold growth and insects. As I mentioned before, there were two tracks. One where we used real buildings, developed a full building simulation model. On, on selected case studies, uh, and we um, uh, on on different case studies, and here you can see Skull Cluster Castle, and uh, and the um, uh, help me, which is the other the, the German castle behind me, Neuschwanstein. I was there this summer, but I was thinking about Linderhof. Um, and um, so this gives us the future indoor climate with a fairly high degree of, of physical precision in these buildings. Uh, and we can connect these to damage functions and come up with a risk assessment for these buildings using state-of-the-art tools to um, uh, identify and quantify the risks uh, for me mechanical damage by deterioration. So this is a tool that for a specific building can say something about future risks for a given building, but we have to invest time in the building simulations. Uh, instead of building simulations, we could take measurements from any kind of building and feed this risk assessment system and get the same kind of output. And I think in, in the short term future, this may be the most common use of, of this part of the method. Going back to the grid, where we had 900 locations with outdoor climate for, for the future periods, the recent, the, the near future and the far future, um, we want to be able to generalize this somehow. And then it's difficult to do that based on real buildings or, or case studies. So uh, instead, we have a system where we, come, where we use ge generic buildings or categories or buildings. Uh, with different climate system complexity, no climate control, sophisticated climate control the way you would have in a museum, buildings of different complexity, 
Uh, and that way we identify 16 different types of generic buildings, developed the simplified building uh, simulation models for these, and ran them uh, for all the 900 locations. That way we could come up with maps producing uh, the, uh, or, or showing the results. So um, one of the uh, coordinators in the, in the project said that this can be seen as a historic building traveling through time and space. So we're taking this model of one building and we put it in 900 different locations. Then we move it to the next time period and do the same thing. And this allows us to come up with maps showing the future indoor climate, but also future risks. Uh, so, the uh, risk maps um, uh, would be using the, the damage functions to connect the, the indoor climate, uh, we get the risk maps. And the combination of all the different building types, uh, of all the um, uh, different damage functions, uh, gives us a huge number of maps. So, so we have a database with not only raw data, but 55,000 uh, maps. And I'm not saying this to impress you, because it is a problem, because you cannot use it the way it is. And I will come back to that. So for now, uh, I will show you only some samples of the output. Uh, we have a number of, of maps showing outdoor climate. And in this case, uh, it shows the temperature, how it increases over time. The more red it is, the more of a temperature change you have. Uh, I told you before that the project focuses on indoor climate, but we also have looked at some outdoor risks, for instance, freezing related to the frost. And this shows frost time over the year and how it changes from the recent past to the far future. Uh, and bluish indicates that frost time decreases, which is what we would expect if we think that climate change also means global warming. Uh, indoor climate risks, an example, uh, the uh, variations in relative humidity uh, over the year. Uh, this shows the range, uh, and you can see over Europe that in some parts, southwest, the uh, variations in relative humidity, which would be important in terms of mechanical damage, increases, whereas in this part of Europe, it would tend to decrease. Another indoor-related risks, it's not limited to indoor, of course, would be insects, and these are temperature-dependent insects that this map shows. And you can see that there is uh, a general increase all over Europe. We are, as I speak, we're completing the final report for the project. There will be scientific publications showing the method as well as the result. So this is not the time to try to conclude uh, the results of the project. That would be a bit too early. I had hoped that we would have been able to finish the reports by now so I, I could tell you more. So, uh, therefore, I'm only able to, to give you some samples of this. But looking at Sweden, for example, I think it's, we can draw some, some general conclusions about the implications of the patterns that we've seen. Uh, we will, or we should, be prepared for a warmer and more humid climate. Um, and on the left, we see something green, it's not mold, but it's algae. In the churches of southern Sweden, we have had an epidemic of mold growth. It's a big problem. Some cases, they've had to close the churches. This problem will grow worse, and it will extend northwards. Um, if we go north, not that far from here, we come to Helsingland, where they had these wonderful wooden buildings that have stood there for hundreds and hundreds of years without any heating or, or very little heating, they're doing just fine. But if we change the geographic boundaries of, of um, wood-eating insects, then suddenly these buildings will be at risk and we need to think about how to prevent that. I mentioned initially 
that for buildings where we have climate control, more or less sophisticated, um, nothing will or very little will happen with the indoor climate, but energy demand will change. And uh, this is energy demand for heating, for cooling, or for humidity control. If you look at the um, four maps on your left, we can see that for heating in general, all over, all over Europe, the energy demand is going to go down. Not surprising. For cooling, the energy demand will go up. It's not so surprising either. Uh, for humidification, which is not so obvious, we will see if you need humidification, for instance, in a museum, that demand is expected to go down, whereas for dehumidification, the energy demand is expected to go up. If you sum them up on a European scale, we have this interesting geographic pattern, sort of split by the Alps, uh, where Northern Europe would have a lower energy demand totally, whereas in uh, Southern Europe, due to cooling mostly, the energy demand would go up in spite of global warming. Um, how would that be affect Sweden? Well, right now the National Museum is being rebuilt and parts of it will have a state-of-the-art climate control system. And the size of that climate control system, the functionality and the future energy demand, of course, is going to depend on uh, climate change. And this is uh, an investment with a considerable technical lifetime. So even though we're talking about changes in 50 or 100 years, this is something that could or should be considered. So that was a bit about future risks associated with climate change. What can we do about it? Uh, well, we can come up with relevant and precise ways of controlling the indoor climate. But then we have to consider the fact that a lot of this requires energy. So we have global climate change, we counteract that with indoor climate control, which in turn require energy. So we're creating a positive feedback loop. And from a global point of view, this is of course marginal. The energy that we're using within cultural heritage is, is quite small, but still, as a matter of principle, if we want to counteract climate change, we should try to do it with using as little energy as possible. So we try to, within a project, to come up with improved damage functions, which would allow us to more precisely control the indoor climate. We have developed climate control algorithms. These are rules for the climate control systems. And again, this would be uh, more precise and smarter ways of achieving the desired indoor climate. Uh, we have looked at the case studies, trying to see if and how we can use or even enhance the passive function of the building. You now we have buildings with a lot of, with, uh, with the high hydrothermal inertia the ability to store heat and moisture, and we can use that to our advantage, which would um, minimize the need for, for active climate control solutions. We have looked into a number of novel technical solutions. Uh, the picture behind me shows a church on the island of Gotland, where I live, uh, where we have used adaptive ventilation. This is ventilation controlled by moisture content inside and outside. So anytime the air outside is drier than inside, you turn on the fan. This is a very low impact, low energy solution. But in order to work properly, you need to add some heat. So therefore we've added the, the solar collectors to provide energy that way. You could do it with, with regular ele electricity, but we wanted to investigate if solar was a way to go. We looked at ways of revitalization of uh, existing technical systems for heating and ventilation in historic buildings. This is something that's often forgotten at, and when, when new technical systems are, are installed, and there is a potential to 
to use old systems, but also you may run into situations where the new systems counteract the function and intention of the old systems. Finally, we looked into ways of uh, integrating or using renewable energy for historic buildings, uh, solar energy, biofuels, etc. Um, risk management is related to decisions um, and um, we have developed a decision support system that would allow the users based on the risk maps that I've showed you before to provide input uh, for a specific building in an interactive way and this decision support system then would suggest different kinds of solutions. This is not instead of using architects, conservators or engineers to come up with a proper design of climate control system, but it's a first step to identify problems and risks and also look at possible solutions. We've written two handbooks, one on energy efficient climate control and one on the use of, of um, renewable energy sources in historic buildings. Getting near the end of my presentation, uh, I want to say something about uncertainty. Uh, you all know that this kind of predictions contain a lot of uncertainty. And in each step, we have an added element of uncertainty. We have the global climate simulations with many uncertain variables. Uh, we have the building simulations where even if you spend years modeling a particular building, it's not the building, it's just a model of the building. And when we use generic buildings, of course, these are just sort of very um, rough uh, reflections of, of, of real buildings. Uh, the damage functions, again, uh, introduce uncertainty. So the question is, what is the effect of uncertainty on the results? And even more challenging, how can we communicate uncertainty in a good way? Um, graphically, we could um, show it with, with converging uh, lines like that, um, or more, even better, some probability cloud where there hopefully would be a higher density somewhere showing more likely futures. Uh, some people take uncertainty uh, as a reason to say, no, I don't believe in climate change. Uh, and and I, this picture, I, I found it on, on the internet, uh, uh, sort of illustrates that kind of thinking. Okay, coming to the conclusion on the project, I think that the main result that we have come up with is the method that allows us to assess climate change risks for historic buildings. And hopefully this method can be used to support decision making for mitigation and um, uh, and adaptation measures both for single buildings and at a policy level because the maps that I showed you may not be that useful for, for the single buildings but we think that on a policy level regionally, nationally, internationally it can be useful. Uh, and we think that even given the uncertainty the method can be used to indicate trends and the magnitude of future risks for cultural heritage. What is happening next? Well, those of you who have been, been, been involved in European projects know that for the project period of time, you have a lot of work and you know, reasonably uh, or, or enough money, but then it ends suddenly. Uh, and, and then when you're at a stage when you really want to continue working with this. But um, there will be a final report. There will be scientific publications, as I said before, presenting the method and the results. Um, I'm working actively to use the method for regional applications within Sweden. Because within our da the data that we have already, we have a high resolution Global climate data is divided into 10 by 10 kilometer squares. So we could use the same method on a regional level using regional building types, uh, developing simulation models for that. I think that is something that could be really useful. 
Um, I would like to take this opportunity to encourage everybody who is involved in, 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 um, in the heritage sector, in, in building conservation in Sweden, that we need to set up a monitoring program. We need to find out what's going on, are there any uh, changes that you can see, uh, and we need to do that on a very long-term basis, uh, 30, 50, maybe 100 years. Uh, the more general question, uh, which I will not suggest an answer to, but it's something that we have to think about, is how do we deal with uncertainty and the long-time perspective? If I believe that there is a considerable risk in 50 years from now, uh, when is the time to act on that? Should we wait and see? Should we act now, maybe taking the risk of having done too much? Um, and I think that as, as humans, we, we tend, we, we have difficulties thinking in, in, in very long-term perspectives. Um, and I think climate change uh, gives us a new challenge uh, on how to deal with uncertainty, but also the very long time perspective. If you want to find out more uh, or follow the, um, the production of, of, of reports uh, on the project, you can go to the climateforculture.eu page, uh, and by the end of the year you will find some, some new material there. Having said that, I hope that when you wake up tomorrow, you will think more specifically about climate change and the risks associated with that. Thank you.